All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Form Check Friday. You can see here we're in the snowy Arctic north of Canada, so welcome to our domain. Um, for those of you who don't know, basically what we do here is we get y'all to email us these lifting videos. I put them up on the screen behind me. We critique them, we break them down, we try to teach y'all some lessons along the way, and uh, we make y'all better lifters. So that's the plan. Let's uh, get to it here. So we left off with Ascari. And again, I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, but yeah, so he had some interesting things to say here. Now, number one, he says he's got some low back discomfort. Um, this is 125 kilos, which is about 80% of his one rep max for six reps. He says he used to have what he called hip imbalances. Uh, in the past that call, caused him pain. And he says he's gonna go get himself checked again to see if he has more imbalances. Um, he's wondering if he should just take it easy, stop squatting for a while and rest. Uh, and he's been lifting for a few years and he's 185 centimeters tall. So first off, I wanna clear up some misconceptions. Generally speaking, uh, the, the concept of a hip imbalance uh, and that being something that causes pain, maybe not a super great or accurate diagnosis. Um, number one, the human body's not symmetrical. Number two, uh, there's really yet to be any kind of concrete or uh, real way to present or to prove that such thing as a hip imbalance uh, exists. So I just, I'm not, I'm not trying to say you're dumb for buying into that or that you're doing anything wrong. Uh, I just want to change the conversation so people aren't chasing down you know, the wrong path. They're not barking up the wrong tree, as it were. Generally speaking, one of the things that we do know that there is a, a decent subset of data and studies that have been done is uh, that the leading cause for pain and injuries is going to be load. And when we look at training, and I've talked about this a number of times, probably even on Form Check Fridays, but when we talk about training, uh, training and the response to training, which is generally us getting stronger, getting more jacked-er, uh, happens in what's called a dose-response relationship. That's why a lot of times when you do more training, you get more result. But in a dose-response relationship like that, which is kind of analogous to any sort of, uh, any sort of pharmaceutical or drug that you would take, like let's say you take 900 grams of Advil and well you have some side effects I think common practice right now if we're if we're following this analogy through to powerlifting would be okay what do I add in to get rid of these side effects side effects being pain the Advil being your training stimulus and what I think a lot of people miss is looking at the training stimulus so generally speaking if we can get load management, if we can get the cause of the issue, the root cause of the issue, which is nine out of 10 times training, if we can get that looked at, if we can figure that out, that's gonna be a way better place to focus your energy, your efforts, your questions, your exploration, than to start looking at like, okay, I need to do these weird piddly little exercises to counter nutate, whatever the hell that means, uh, this, that, and the other thing to try to like, strengthen my internal rotation, I'm lacking this range of motion, et cetera, et cetera. These are a lot of things that I think people uh, gatekeep with. I think a lot of people will, you know, create a problem and then sell you the answer. And I'm here to tell you that most of the time, uh, you can have some intelligent conversations, you can ask some good questions, you can analyze your own training. If you have a good coach, a lot of times they can help with this. And if it is a more complex problem, then there are really good physiotherapists out there shoot me an email, I can send you a referral to some physios that lift, that understand lifting, and that understand pain and injuries. So anyways, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now and say the first thing I would do, uh, like I don't think your technique looks inefficient at all. I don't think you're really suffering from any kind of uh, issue as a result of your technique. Uh, you have uh, an impeccably good squat. Uh, maybe use a little bit more depth, but again, this angle can be a bit deceiving when it comes to depth. Your, your bracing looks great. You're well balanced on your feet. There's maybe a few reps where your hips kind of come up behind you, but you know, for that, just try to keep your knees forward out of the bottom. Be a little bit patient. Um, what I would look at, honestly, is just your training dose, right? 
is there a correlation between the amount of volume that you're doing or the loads that you're using that causes this discomfort? If so, let's scale training back to just shy of that, right? So let's say if you do four sets of squats, you end up walking out like, ah, yeah, I'm a little messed up today. But if you do three sets of squats, it doesn't bother you. Let's scale to three sets of squats. Let's use that as a jumping off point. Let's keep that consistent as your training dose for a number of weeks. And then let's think about adding in a fourth set. If it's load related, generally what we'll do is we'll say, okay, well, how much can you lift in your session and not have any of these adverse effects or this discomfort? Let's start there. Keep that weight consistent for three or four weeks and then start adding small amounts of load to progress back up. Um, and lastly, the other thing I would recommend looking at is range of motion. It might be that right now, for whatever reason, you're sensitive to the bottom position of the squat. So squatting high, uh, doing a high bar squat, using an SSB, maybe pausing or using a tempo, a lot of different exercise modifications we can do to kind of work around pain. But the big thing you're trying to do here, if you have pain, if you have some kind of injury that's limiting you, is find a way to keep training whatever that training looks like without pain and without aggravating it and making it worse and use that as a starting point to move forward. So hopefully some of that uh, long-winded diatribe makes some kind of sense uh, and helps all y'all out out there, uh, especially you Ascari. Uh, hopefully, that, hopefully that helps. All right, we're going to dive into Henrik, Henrik's bench press. Um, we're not going to dive into Henrik. We're going to dive into Henrik's bench press. Lifting for about a year and a half. No plans on competing. Goals are general strength. Uh, he says he's struggling with keeping tightness on the bench. He says his bench has been plateaued for a while and that this is 67 and a half kilos. So let's take a look. The first thing I'm noticing is uh, anybody who knows this channel knows me well, knows that I like a wide grip on the bench press. You know, what happens is we get down to this sort of bottom of the bench and we end up in a lot of cases having to lose a lot of shoulder tightness and tension and stability in order to touch the chest um, just due to how much the, the the upper limb of the arm needs to travel by widening the grip the elbow is going to be coming to a stop a little bit higher up as we touch the chest right because the, um, the hands are going to be a little wider. It's going to trim the range of motion just a little bit. So that's one of the places that I often start with a bench that looks like this. The other thing I would say is um, look at your programming, right? If you're, if you're plateaued for any substantial amount of time, I mean, I've seen a lot of people get really strong with poor technique. Um, and I don't think this is poor technique. Let's clear that up. But I do think that intelligent programming probably accounts for uh, a lot more of a lifter's programming than their technique does. Maybe that's a hot take, maybe not. But um, So I would recommend, you know, checking out some programming. Now, obviously, you know me, I'm going to plug the Calgary Barbell Training app. There's a link to that down below. 23 programs, form checks, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of like coaching light uh, without the, you know, one-on-one -on -one aspect of it. But we, uh, we make it work for y'all. So if you're interested, check that out. But also, I think adding in some movement variability or, or variation, sorry. So number one, pausing on the chest is going to get you a lot stronger on the chest because that's where you're losing tightness, right? Like, let's be real. Uh, things look good until about here. Then the bar comes down. It impacts you slightly. You kind of bounce it. And then you're trying to recover from losing some shoulder position. Maybe the butt goes up in the air but we're losing position from here to here. So that tells me the range of motion we need to focus on is in the bottom. So whether you're doing uh, what's called a spoto press, so a spoto press, you're, you're essentially coming down to almost the full range of motion. You're pausing about an inch and a half or, or what, what is that, like six, seven centimeters? Probably wrong there, but anyways, somewhere around that range. Uh, and you're doing sort of an isometric hold just above the chest. The other thing you can do is isometric holds on the chest. You can use a tempo to smooth out the eccentric. But the big thing is to learn to east decelerate, sorry, um, to decelerate the bar on the eccentric or the lowering phase of the movement so that you can have more control in uh, sort of overcoming the inertia of changing the direction of the bar off of your chest, right? So if we're losing a lot of control in the bottom, we're also generally sacrificing some consistency. Most of the time we're sacrificing some tightness and it is in the sort of bottom of the range of motion where we're losing a lot of the tightness. So um, yeah, 
overall programming and then just using some bench variations, perhaps increasing your bench frequency and playing around with your bench grip width, right? Those will be the biggest things I would start with. Uh, there's probably more we can sort of retool down the road, but definitely uh, don't want to over inundate people with cues and too many things to think about at once. All right, so we have Odette here. Uh, she's been powerlifting for two years. PR is 150 kilos, which is a great deadlift. Good for you. Uh, and she says she struggles with consistent bracing. So she's noticing a little bit of backgrounding on some of her lifts. Uh, and this video is 130 kilos. So honestly, Odette, um, these are phenomenally well executed deadlifts. I can see what you're talking about in terms of like, okay, so this third deadlift, we do see uh, a little bit of, of a, you're kind of pulling in with the upper body, but you're not tightening the lower body in order to, to pull the slack out. So one of my clients, uh, this guy, Charlie, Charlie, and I'm never going to pronounce his last name right, but Athanasio. Um, so Charlie uh, works for a gym or owns a gym rather called Melbourne Strength Culture. They have a great video they just put out uh, about how to push the slack out of the bar as opposed to pulling it out of the bar. And I, I get what they're doing. They're, they're kind of doing a play on words like don't pull the slack out, try pushing it out. But I do think they have some really good points. Um, so I would check out Melbourne Strength Culture for some cues on how to push the slack out of the bar because I do feel like we're doing a good job with the upper body. We're pulling the slack out of the bar, right? We're getting tight in the lats. Um, we're getting tight across the upper back. But I think we're not applying enough pressure to the floor as you're pulling your hips into position. I think we could be tighter in the quads, hamstrings, and hips as we begin the lift. Because there is a little bit of a lag where the, the legs start to push and that bar is listing us just slightly out forward off the floor. Other than that, like your, your deadlifts are phenomenal. You, you have great positioning, great tightness, a good solid and clean lockout. These are really good, but I can see what you mean about that slight little lapse in tightness off the floor. And I think it's getting a little bit more leg tension as you're, as you're pulling or pushing the slack out of the bar. That would be my, my recommendation there on debt. I hope that helps. All right. Up next is Stefan or Stefan. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say Stefan, I think. And let's take a look. So he says his squat progressing is progressing really slow. He says it's 100, 100 pounds behind the deadlift, so he must be doing something wrong. And this is going to cause me to, to um, kind of go off topic here, or maybe not off topic, but I'm going to go out into the bushes a little bit here and say that uh, there is this really common sort of misconception that if there's a big gap between your squat and your deadlift um, or that you squat more than you deadlift, you know, most people will attribute that to some kind of deficiency. Um, I mean... I'm a pretty successful lifter. Uh, I've placed uh, top three overall at Worlds. I've broken numerous world records. I've been competitive in multiple weight classes, both raw and equipped, uh, at the international level in the IPF. And I have outpulled my squat by probably 100 pounds or more for most of my career. Doesn't mean you have a bad squat. I would actually turn that framing on its head and say, oh, I got a good deadlift. Now, whether or not that's helpful, I don't know. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think that like, oh, you know, I must be doing something wrong is the way to react to like your squat being 100 pounds behind your deadlift. You might be a really good deadlifter. A lot of people who are, are built for certain lifts and not so much for others. Um, but again, like that doesn't mean that you're not going to have to work on that lift or that you should just like accept the fact that, uh, that there's that discrepancy. But... Yeah, I th just think there's this like big misconception that like your lifts should balance out in a certain way. And it doesn't necessarily ever work out that way uh, unless you're like Bryce Lewis or somebody who's just good at everything in powerlifting. Good at all three. Um, now that I've said that, I'm going to uh, let's let's dig into this uh, context a little bit more. So he wants to compete next year coming off of heavy singles and is a little bit concerned about depth. Um, so he said he's. He's taken a bit of the weight off and is trying to get a little more comfortable in the bottom position and uh, is worried about a little bit of butt wink. So, number one, look pretty solid out of the rack. Good on rack. Uh, I, I, think, I think we need to get tighter out of the rack. Honestly, it looks solid when you pick it up, but then when you go to step, uh, it's, it's looking like we don't have a whole lot going on in here. Right, our upper back is nice and tight. I like this upper back positioning, but like fill that belt out, take a huge breath, push your abs and your obliques out into the belt and get this crap tight. Make that whole 
excuse me, that whole trunk and torso super, super tight from the moment you unrack. Now, because you're being sort of not hyper conscious, but you're being highly conscious of your depth here, um, I think that's causing you to go almost a little excessively deep. This angle, again, is not the best or most accurate view of what depth is uh, or, or what your actual depth is, what, what kind of depth you're getting, I should say. So you might be going a little excessively deep. Um, this like tiny little bit of movement in the low back is honestly absolutely not something I would worry about. However, if that movement in the low back is an indication that we're losing a lot of bracing in the bottom, that we're, we're loosening in order to get a lot more depth than we need, then I'm going to recommend we work more on, again, that bracing through the midsection, through the trunk, into the bottom. We have to really work to hold that bracing and not release it, or at least release the minimum amount to get to powerlifting competition depth. So maintaining more tightness in the lower sort of lower trunk is going to be where I'm going to say you should focus. I can't see your feet, so I don't know if we're like rocking forward in the bottom. It looks pretty good on that front actually. And yeah, your depth looks great. Your upper back looks great. Overall, the mechanics of your squat are really good. But I think the big thing here is, is really pushing out into the belt. And again, if you feel like there's a discrepancy uh, or like a deficiency in your squat, smart programming goes a long ways. So again, I'm going to recommend the Calgary Barbell app. Check it out. It's pretty pretty great place to get your foot in the door with a lot of good programming. We do form checks like this uh, today. Actually, I'm going to go home. I'm going to open up the Discord on this window uh, and go through everybody who's posted in there. Gets their form checked by me twice a week. So... Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty great. Anyways, let's take a look at Seth. Seth's bench press uh, is 245 pounds. Didn't give me really any context other than that. Just says, hey, can you help? Uh, and yes, I can. So very similar to what I was telling Henrik. Um, you're, just, you're just dropping the bar on yourself. We're not pulling the shoulders into position really at all for this unrack. Um, you're, you're really protracted. So... I know I've probably gone through this a few times for anybody who's watched Form Check Friday for a while. Maybe put it on two times speed for a sec. But there are four sort of movements that we're concerned about when we're talking about shoulder blade position on the bench press. So these are your shoulder blades. This is your back, right? These are your shoulder blades. Protraction means they're moving away from the midline of your body towards the front of your body. Elevation means they're shrugging upwards, right? Your shoulders are coming up towards your ears retraction is pulling them together towards the midline of your body in your in your back and depression means that you're pulling them down your back down towards your butt so what we want are retraction pulling the shoulder blades together and depression pulling the shoulder blades down you see how my chest comes up when i do that right now you've got a decent bit of arch but it really ends here because the shoulder blades are really protracted and potentially elevated, but definitely protracted, right? You're like reaching way out to the bar. When you set up for your bench, you want that bar as close to your chest as you can before you start the press. There you go, there's a cue. There's, there's, there's a key that I'm gonna see somebody regurgitate at some point. But you want that bar as close to your chest as possible out of the rack, right? So if you can pull your shoulder blades together harder, you can pull your shoulder blades down more, it's gonna drive your chest up more, it's gonna make this bar start half an inch, an inch, an inch and a half closer to your chest at lockout, it's gonna really trim down that range of motion. Now, aside from that, it's also gonna provide you a really stable base of support on the bench. Because if you think about your back laying on the bench, you pull those shoulder blades together and down, all of a sudden you're flat against the bench, your shoulder blades have been tucked in, and you're not gonna wobble so much from side to side. Right, so out of the rack here, we can see, we're not super locked in there. On the way down, everything's kind of moving around a lot. We don't have a lot of lower body tension. You drop the bar on yourself, you bounce it, and then we're like just struggling to get it up. So, I mean, this is fine for like a gym gym PR attempt. Um, but if you're looking to get into powerlifting, this is like, that's not how you're going to be training. Basically, for powerlifting training, you're going to be pausing on your chest. You're going to need to have at least some semblance of control through the bottom of the range of motion. Again, you know, some lifters will touch heavier, some lifters will touch lighter, but you need to be in control when the bar is on your chest because you need to be able to wait for a press command and then press the bar off your chest. Now, these benches look like they're really low to the ground and it looks like you have really long legs. 
So this is unfortunate, but it's gonna be tough for you to get a good leg and foot position, especially if we're talking about getting your heels down on the ground. But I think it's necessary. So there's a few options here. You can bring your feet out wider and out this way a little bit so you can get the heel down in contact with the ground. Again, I think base, I think support is something we're really missing a lot of here. I think our feet are just kind of pulled back, we're toe picking, and like you can you can watch through the lift. There's not a lot of support. The legs are not contributing a lot to stability here. Right? They're kind of wobbling around, you're, you're pushing, your butt comes up off the bench. So we need to find a way where the legs are increasing the stability of our body on the bench. So like I said, you can pull them out this way, or you can you can try setting them up out here, closer together, and then like trying to pinch the bench with your thighs. Now that's something that is, is maybe less, what's the word I'm looking for? It's something that less people do, but some people who it works for, it works really, really well. Um, so yeah, think about maybe putting your feet like out here and trying to apply pressure back this way. That's, that can work for really, you know, longer, taller people or on shorter benches or if you just have long legs. So yeah, hopefully that's enough, uh, enough to go off of there, Seth. Best of luck with that bench. Okay, Noah. So Noah's been lifting for five months now, working on the big three, doing a PPL split, which is push-pull legs. Um, basically splitting those up into their separate days. So one day you do push, next day you do pull, next day you do legs. Um, he says he's trying to lock in his deadlift setup, but he's 6'3", he's tall. So uh, he says his deadlift max is 275 conventional. And this is a set of five at about 80%, RP eight to nine uh, on that. His sticking point, he figures is about two inches off the ground and he thinks he might be locking his knees a little bit too early. So I want everybody watching right now to head down in the comments section below, leave some constructive criticism on how you would approach coaching or cueing uh, Noah's deadlift here. And I'm gonna start next week with Noah's deadlift first thing on Friday. If you guys like this content, make sure to stop by our live stream at twitch.tv slash Calgary Barbell. And uh, we do literally this on stream and you can send your lifts in in real time, live time. Anyways, um, yeah, that's it for me. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and um, we'll see you next Friday. Bye y'all.